Let's get weird into it. Number 10, the duck's silent quack. You've probably heard this one whispered at a slumber party or on a dubious corner of the internet. A duck's quack doesn't echo. It's a fact so bizarre and specific that it just has to be true, right? We picture a duck standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon, letting out a mighty quack, only for the sound to be swallowed by an indifferent universe. No reply, just silence and the quiet judgment of a nearby squirrel. It's the kind of fact that makes you feel like you have a secret key to understanding the universe. Ducks, the acoustic black holes of the animal kingdom. Except it's complete nonsense. A duck's quack echoes just like any other sound. This myth was so pervasive that it was even tested on the show Mythbusters. They brought a duck into an anechoic chamber, then into a reverberant hall, and spoiler alert, the quack echoed. Scientists at the University of Salford in the UK also debunked it, proving that a quack's echo is just a little hard to hear sometimes. The sound of a quack is a complex waveform that fades in and fades out, which means its echo gets smeared and blended into the original sound, especially in wide-open natural spaces like, you know, a pond. It's not that the echo isn't there, it's just that it's not the crisp, sharp, hello, hello, hello you get from shouting into a cave. The universe isn't specifically silencing ducks for some cosmic violation. They're just not great at producing clear, distinct echoes in the environments they frequent. So the next time someone tells you a duck's quack doesn't echo, you can tell them that's a load of quackery. Number nine, dogs see in black and white. We love to imagine the world from our dog's perspective. A beautiful, vibrant sunset, to them, it's just another boring gray smear in the sky. That bright red ball you just threw? A dull, muddy blob against a field of slightly different dull, muddy blobs. We've built this entire narrative around our canine companions living in a sad, colorless film noir, where the only thing that matters is the smell of bacon and the sound of the treat bag opening. It's a tale of tragic grayscale loyalty, but your dog isn't living in an episode of The Twilight Zone. They do see color, just not the same way we do. Humans have three types of color-detecting cone cells in our eyes, letting us see the full red, green, and blue spectrum. Dogs, on the other hand, are dichromats. They only have two types of cones, which are sensitive to blue and yellow. This means their world is mostly a mix of blues, yellows, and the grayish-browns that result from mixing those. What they can't distinguish well are reds and greens. To your dog, a vibrant red rose sitting in a lush green lawn looks like a yellowish-brown flower in a field of, well, also yellowish-brown. It's similar to the most common form of human color blindness. So while they can't appreciate the full majesty of a rainbow, their world is far from black and white. In fact, they have other visual advantages, like better night vision and a superior ability to detect motion. So don't feel too bad for them. They may not know that their favorite toy is Fire Engine Red, but they can definitely see you trying to sneak a chip from a mile away. Number 8. Ostriches bury their heads in the sand. Picture it. A cartoon ostrich, spooked by a tiny mouse, frantically digs a hole and shoves its entire head into the sand, convinced it has achieved perfect invisibility. It's an image so deeply embedded in our culture that burying your head in the sand has become a universal metaphor for willful ignorance. We've seen it in Looney Tunes, we've read it in fables. The ostrich is nature's ultimate avoidance specialist. If it can't see the problem, the problem doesn't exist. A philosophy many of us have tried to apply to our credit card statements. This is, to put it mildly, a terrible survival strategy. An animal that weighs up to 300 pounds and can run at 45 miles per hour does not deal with danger by suffocating itself. If that were their go-to move, lions would just be walking around a field of ostrich butts, wondering where to start. The myth likely comes from a misunderstanding of a few different ostrich behaviors. Ostriches dig shallow holes in the dirt to use as nests for their eggs, which are, by the way, enormous. Several times a day, the parent ostrich will use its beak to turn the eggs in the nest. From a distance, this looks a lot like it's sticking its head into the ground. Furthermore, when an ostrich feels threatened and can't run, its first instinct is to lie down and press its long neck and head flat against the ground. Since their head and neck are a sandy color, it blends in with the terrain, making it look like the body is just a weird feathery rock. It's a camouflage attempt, not a self-induced dirt nap. So the ostrich isn't an idiot. It's just a very large, very fast bird. That's also a pretty decent parent trying to hide. Number seven, the lemming death march. There is no image more tragically absurd in the animal kingdom than the lemming. A tiny furry rodent, driven by some mysterious primal urge, marches with thousands of its brethren to the edge of a seaside cliff. There, without hesitation, they leap into the churning waves below, a mass suicide pact orchestrated by mother nature herself. 
It's the ultimate example of nature's cruel, unfeeling logic, a built-in, self-destruct button for population control. This entire dramatic narrative is a complete fabrication, and we have one specific company to thank for it, Disney. In their 1958 nature documentary, White Wilderness, the filmmakers wanted to capture this legendary lemming behavior. The only problem was it doesn't happen. So they did what any aspiring storyteller would do. They faked it. They bought a bunch of lemmings from local kids in Canada, flew them to a cliff overlooking a river, not even the ocean, and then literally herded them off the edge with brooms. The narration somberly explained this as a natural phenomenon, and an entire generation was duped into believing these little critters were suicidal. The truth is much less cinematic. Lemming populations do experience massive boom and bust cycles. When their numbers explode, they exhaust their food supply and are forced to migrate in huge groups to find new territory. They are good swimmers, but when they reach a large body of water like a river or a fjord, their sheer numbers and desperation can cause a chaotic pileup at the water's edge. Some get pushed in, some jump in trying to cross, and many inevitably drown. It's not suicide, it's a traffic jam gone horribly wrong. They aren't trying to end it all. They're just trying to get to the all-you-can-eat salad bar on the other side. Number 6. The Unfairly Accused Baby Bird You're a kid, walking through your backyard, and you see it. A tiny, featherless baby bird fallen from its nest. Your first instinct is to help. You gently scoop it up, your heart filled with noble, heroic purpose. But then your mom comes running out, yelling, Don't touch it! If you get your scent on it, the mother will abandon it forever. You drop the bird, recoil in horror, and spend the rest of your childhood convinced you are a monster who condemned a helpless creature to a lonely, tragic fate because your hands smelled like cheese puffs. Let this be a balm for your childhood guilt. That's not how it works. Most birds have a terrible, almost non-existent sense of smell. They navigate the world by sight and sound. A mother bird is not going to fly back to her nest, take a delicate sniff, and declare, Ugh, this one smells of human and regret. I'm out of here. She simply doesn't have the olfactory hardware to detect your scent. What she can detect is a predator messing with her nest, or the nest being significantly disturbed. The real reason a mother bird might abandon a nest is due to repeated disturbances. If a predator, or a well-meaning but clumsy human, is constantly poking around, she might decide the location is unsafe and cut her losses. So, the advice to leave baby birds alone is still good advice, just for the wrong reason. If you find a baby bird on the ground, the best thing to do is gently place it back in its nest if you can safely do so. The mother won't know you were there. She's too busy trying to find worms to care that her kid briefly smelled like a 7-Eleven. Number 5. The Deadly Daddy Long Legs Every schoolyard has its own resident biologist, the kid who confidently shares nature facts with the unshakable authority of a seasoned professor. And their magnum opus is always the legend of the daddy long legs. You see that thing? They'll whisper, pointing to a spindly creature in the corner of the ceiling. It's the most venomous spider in the world. Its poison could kill a horse in seconds. The only reason it doesn't kill us is because its fangs are too small and weak to pierce human skin. We are saved from certain death by a mere quirk of dental engineering. This is a fantastic story. It's got drama, danger, and a convenient, built-in plot twist. It's also wrong on pretty much every level. First, the term daddy long legs is used to describe at least three different creatures. One is the cellar spider, which is a true spider. It does have venom and fangs, but a study showed its venom had a negligible effect on mice. And there's no evidence its fangs are incapable of biting humans. They're just not dangerous. The second is the harvestman, which isn't even a spider. It's an arachnid, but it has one body segment instead of two. And more importantly, it has no venom glands or fangs at all. It's about as dangerous as a housefly. The third is the crane fly, which is an insect that just looks like a giant mosquito and is completely harmless. So, one of them isn't a spider, one is a fly, and the one that is a spider is basically a tiny eight-legged wimp. The myth of its deadly venom is just that, a myth likely invented to make the creepy crawlies in our basements seem a lot cooler than they actually are. Number four, the goldfish with no memory. The goldfish, a beautiful, simple creature doomed to a life of endless loops. It swims to one side of its bowl, completely forgets where it is and how it got there, and then, with the wonder of a newborn babe, discovers the other side of the bowl for the first time. Three seconds later, the cycle repeats. We project this Sisyphean tragedy onto them, imagining their tiny brains are constantly hitting the reset button. It's why we feel okay keeping them in a small glass bowl. What are they going to miss? 
they can't even form a memory of being bored. This popular notion is an insult to goldfish everywhere. These little fish are surprisingly intelligent. Studies have shown that goldfish can remember things for at least five months. They can be trained to respond to specific sounds or colors, navigate mazes, and even perform tricks like pushing a tiny soccer ball into a net. They can recognize their owner's faces and will often swim to the front of the tank when they see the person who feeds them approaching. The three-second memory myth is just a convenient excuse for our own laziness. If you believe your pet has no capacity for memory or learning, you don't have to feel bad about providing a less than stimulating environment. But your goldfish knows. It remembers that plastic castle you put in its tank. It remembers the taste of its food. And it definitely remembers that time you almost forgot to feed it. It's not swimming around in a state of perpetual amnesia. It's swimming around in its tiny aquatic house, silently judging your inconsistent feeding schedule. Number three, the blindness of bats. Blind as a bat. The phrase is so common, it's practically a law of nature. We picture bats as these clumsy, sightless creatures, stumbling through the night, entirely dependent on a magical sonar system to keep from flying into walls. Their eyes, we assume, are just decorative little beads, vestigial organs from a time before they evolved their cool, clicking superpower. They traded the world of sight for the world of sound. This is a fundamental misunderstanding of how bats operate. No species of bat is blind. In fact, many of them can see quite well. Their eyes are small but fully functional. The thing is, eyesight isn't very useful when you're a nocturnal hunter trying to catch a tiny, fast-moving insect in the dead of night. For that, you need something better. That's where echolocation comes in. It's not a replacement for sight, it's a high-tech upgrade. It's like having both a flashlight and a military-grade radar system. Think of it this way. You have perfectly good eyes, but if you walk into a pitch-black room, you're going to put your hands out in front of you to feel your way around. You haven't gone blind. You're just using a different sense to navigate an environment where your primary sense is useless. Bats do the same thing. They use their eyes for long-distance navigation and spotting predators in low light, and they switch to echolocation for the fine detail work of hunting. They aren't blind, they're just multitasking sensory pros. Number two, the drowning earthworm. A heavy rainstorm passes, and the sidewalks are suddenly littered with the writhing bodies of earthworms. It's a scene of mass exodus, and the common explanation is a simple one. Their underground burrows have flooded, and they've scurried to the surface to escape a watery grave. They are fleeing for their lives, desperately seeking high ground to avoid drowning. It makes perfect sense. They breathe through their skin, and they can't do that underwater, right? Well, not exactly. While the logic is sound, it's not the whole story. Earthworms can actually survive submerged in water for several days as long as the water has enough oxygen in it. They aren't gasping for air the moment their tunnels get a little damp. So if they're not escaping a flood, what are they doing? There are a couple of leading theories. One is migration. Wet ground and high humidity provide the perfect conditions for worms to travel long distances over the surface without drying out. The sidewalk is like a superhighway for them, a chance to move to new territory and find a mate without turning into a crispy worm chip. Another theory is that the vibrations from the falling rain sound similar to the vibrations made by predators like moles. The worms might be coming to the surface as a predator avoidance tactic, ironically putting them in a much more dangerous place a pavement full of hungry birds and careless pedestrians. So they aren't fleeing a flood. They're either on a romantic road trip or running from a phantom menace that exists only in their tiny, soil-filled minds. Number one, glass is a liquid. This is the ultimate, well-actually fact, the kind you pull out to sound smart at a party. Go to any old European cathedral and look at the stained glass windows. You'll notice they're often thicker at the bottom than at the top. The explanation? Glass is not a true solid. It's an amorphous solid a supercooled liquid that is flowing downwards with glacial slowness over centuries, pulled by the relentless force of gravity. Your own windows at home are doing it right now, just very, very slowly. It's a mind-bending concept that makes the world feel a little less stable, a little more fluid. It's also completely wrong. Glass is, for all practical purposes, a solid. While it's true that it's an amorphous solid, meaning its atoms aren't arranged in a neat crystalline lattice that doesn't make it a liquid, it doesn't flow. The calculations for how long it would take a pane of glass to flow a noticeable amount at room temperature are longer than the age of the universe. So why are those old cathedral windows thicker at the bottom? The answer is much more mundane. Medieval glassmaking technology was just not very good. When they created panes of glass, the process resulted in sheets that were uneven and imperfect, 
thicker in some spots, thinner in others. When it came time to install the windows, the sensible glaziers of the day simply put the thickest, heaviest part at the bottom for stability. That's it. It's not a testament to the strange physics of supercooled liquids. It's a testament to the practicality of medieval craftsmen. So no, your window isn't melting. It's just a solid, doing a very solid job of keeping the rain out. That's all for today. I'll be making similar videos in the future. Subscribe to see them.